Well, I saw an article in a men's health magazine about John Bon Jovi and how he was not exactly a saint to his wife in their marriage. Now, they've been married for 35 years. It looked like he married his high school sweetheart. And over the course of his rock and roll career, he had not exactly been a saint, meaning he was having lots of philandering with his groupies and whoever else that wandered into the semi at night after the concert. So they said his wife, though, stuck by him and she was faithful to him. And it made me think, well, I mean, at least faithful. They stayed married, and I think they have a decent marriage from the way the article sounded. Now, maybe she was messing around with the pool boy or whatever. Who knows? But they stayed together. They've got four kids, beautiful family. And so, you know, it worked out okay, even though John Bon Jovi was not exactly a saint. And it made me think of an article by Pastor Dalrock about Christian complementarian women. Now, complementarianism, again, is the view that of Scripture lately that men are the head and women are to be submissive to the head. But in actuality, it just means that men are to submit to women and women's desires. So it really works out and shakes out in any practical teaching in complementarianism, right? So Pastor Dal Dalrock wrote an article about this, and the title of the article was, They're Too Traditional to Stay Married. And it was about a sociologist who was not a Christian, who's not religious, but he wrote an article on the purity industrial complex, and he thought it was really odd that traditional complementarian women <clears throat> would divorce their husbands at an astoundingly high rate compared to any other demographic of either Christian or non-Christian women. They would divorce their husbands because they looked at naughty pictures on the internet. They were watching naughty videos on the internet. He says that his observation is that complementarian wives are twice as likely as other women to divorce their husbands for viewing the corno. And he says that it's not because their husbands are looking at corn any more often than any non-traditional Protestant husbands, but it's because they draw a hard line and they consider the corn use not just analogous, but literally adultery or betrayal or some kind of irredeemable perversion. And so the consequences of the corno use for their relationships are extreme compared to the consequences for anybody else's relationships. He says you've got these marriages that are blowing up because of pornography. With the survey data, I'm able to see the severity of the consequences over the general population, but I'm not able to hear their stories. So it was so powerful to me when Christian women would describe what it was like to discover their husband was looking at the corn. The anger that they felt, the betrayal that they described, and how they were processing it, how they called it adultery, and how they said it was betrayal. Or, this sociologist said he would interview the husbands, would describe how they would get caught and talk about how their wives didn't talk to them for two weeks and threaten them with divorce. One of them came home with bags packed on the front porch when his wife discovered this. Now, here's what Pastor Dalrock writes about this sociologist who just thought it was unbelievable that these traditional women who are complementarian, this is the big divider there, they are complementarian traditional Protestant women, are twice as likely to divorce over this. The husband's looking at naughty pictures, viewing naughty videos. Okay, twice as likely. He says, what? He's like smacking his head. What, what is going on here? What is going on? here? And so Pastor Dalrock writes, coming from the outside, the sociologist doesn't understand that this is all about power. Complementarians pretend that they believe in biblical headship. But in practice, the foundation of complementarianism is that the wife is in charge. 
Pornography threatens this cherished lever of power for complementarian wives, which is the denial of bedroom privileges. This lever of power isn't unique to complementarian wives, as all wives are tempted to use this lever. This is actually seen in recent, this is in 2019, he was writing, he was writing this, but Alyssa Milano's recent call for a sex strike over abortion, meaning women are mad, and so they're going on a sex strike, right? They, they want to use the power of denial of sex. Now, Athel K. wrote the book, The Married Man's Sex Life, and actually it's a really good book. I would, I would recommend that to somebody. Um, to read, I mean, maybe from a Christian lens, you know, you got to be a little careful there, but I think there's some fundamentals there that are actually really good. But Athel K. explained how corn threatens this level of power and why wives using the denial of sex to manipulate their husbands have a much more violent reaction to their husband's viewing of corn than other wives do in his post. This is Athel K.'s post, Wives Denying Sex and the corn firewall. <laughs> so here's what Apple K say. This is, this is pretty inter- insightful. He says, here's the situation. After several months or a few years of a wife denying sex, the husband ends up seeking some kind of sexual solace in using corn to jack off to. Typically, he carefully hides this activity from his wife because he knows the reaction he'll get. Sure enough, eventually he slips up and she discovers whereupon she reacts the way he knew that she would with a huge explosion of rage. Corn, it will be explained to them, is demeaning to women, disgusting, immoral, wrong, disappointing, revolting, and hurtful. It is also very likely to explain to him that his use of corn has now put the relationship back several steps, just as she was starting to feel she could open up to him, but of course now she can't, and it's all his fault. Thus, this is Athel K, thus the corn firewall is created. He writes, the unmet need for sex is a powerful impulse in a man, and to keep a man physically healthy in an intimate relationship, he needs that. But to deny him sex requires the heavy hand of control. It's an old behavioral technique to smack down hard on a person making a minor infraction to intimidate them into never even considering this major infraction of possibly, you know, finding an actual new woman, right? And so that's what Ethel K says. I thought that, that's interesting. And so then Pastor Dalrock, he says, complementarians are very coy about this, but they play the same script as what Ethel K is saying in just in general and in, in whoever. Pastor Doug Wilson explains in his book, The Suitor and His Corn, <clears throat> that the problem with the corno is that it makes husbands lazy. And therefore, they won't be willing to work hard enough to earn the sex from their wife. Here's what he... Or wait a minute, I'm not going to read that whole article. I think I've covered that one before, though. I think I've talked about that one before. Dr. Albert Moeller, president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, explains that the problem with porno is mostly the same as what Doug Wilson is saying here. He says, put most bluntly, I believe that God means for a man to be civilized, directed, and stimulated toward marital faithfulness by the fact that his wife will freely give herself to him only when he presents himself as worthy of her attention and desire. Pastor Dave Wilson says also that God communicates his displeasure with husbands through their wives' non-burning bush. I've covered that one. I've covered that one as well, I think, too. And so Pastor Don Rock writes that the complementarian response to men viewing the corno isn't about the threat that corno poses as a sin, because it is, lust is a sin. But complementarians don't view it like that. It's the threat that Corno poses to one of complementarians' favorite sin, the sin of the woman having her husband submit to her. 
He says, key to understanding this is to remember that the Bible teaches that husbands and wives are not ever to deny sex to each other except for a time to pray and then come together quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, because if they do deny, this will create a temptation for sexual sin. And so complementarians have inverted scripture because Paul, what Paul tells us is prohibited, the denial of sex, is a cherished tool for complementarian wives. They are too traditional to stay married. He says, in this sense, it is a sin being used to further another sin. So the sin of denial of sex is a tool to further the sin of not submitting to their husbands. Husbands viewing the corn threatens this cherished complementarian sin. And so it must be eradicated, not because it's a sin in and of itself, of lust, no, not because of that, because it threatens our cherished value of the husband not submitting to the wife. <laughs> he says one way to cross-check this is to see if the complementarian response to women than using the corno is similar. And he says complementarians, they don't teach that a husband's sexual attraction to his wife is God's method of making his wife submit to him. Can you imagine if, if that was actually taught? He writes that the sociologist Samuel Perry explained that complementarian husbands don't threaten their wives with divorce after viewing the corno. And so it's a really it's a really interesting article. I was just thinking about it as you know, I was reading about John Bon Jovi and his wife married 35 years. He was obviously not faithful to her, but she stayed married to him. And our Christian women who are traditional can't even stay married when their husband looks at a naughty picture, which he should not be doing, viewing naughty pictures, naughty movies. He should not be doing that. That is lust, that's sin. Shouldn't be doing that. But we're going to divorce over that. Even the secular world looks in and says, wow, this is crazy. And it is crazy. And we got to get it correct. And also, Christ is winning. He is building his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Until next time, this is the Post Millennial Man.